we're Compound Everything, and this is our first video of 2024 after a little bit of a break. Yep. And today we are talking about Terry Smith, who runs a fund called Fund Smith. Yes. So do you want to introduce who Terry Smith is? So Terry Smith is one of those investors that came on our radar a little later on. So everyone's, well, not everyone, but a lot of people have heard of Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, who recently passed away, unfortunately. So Terry Smith is someone who came on our radar a little later on. So we've been investing for several years now, and we like to coattail investors. And Terry Smith is someone we stumbled upon. I'm not quite sure how. I think on X, you probably found some sort of post about him. I did find some posts on X about him, but I've also, we also follow Dataroma. Yeah. So Dataroma is a good resource for those of you who like to coattail investors. Mm -hmm. And so I, I came across his name on there, I think. It actually mm -hmm. follows his fund, if I'm not mistaken. And his fund is, again, called Fundsmith. And so we came across him and decided to look into him a little bit. And actually, hit a lot of his information he posts on his website. So if you go to, if you put into Google or your favorite search engine, Fundsmith, and type in Terry Smith, it'll take you to his fund. And he lead, leaves all his investor letters there. But who is Terry Smith? That's a long-winded way of introducing him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Terry Smith is, a, is probably one of the number one ranked investors in Britain. Mm -hmm. He is noted as the Warren Buffett of... Britain, which is pretty high praise in the mm -hmm. financial community. If someone equates you to Warren Buffett of anywhere, you're probably doing pretty darn good yeah. for yourself. And he's compounded money for his investors at about 15% and change over the past 14 years now. His, his fund started around 2010 and he's compounded money at about 15% annually since that time. So his... That's an annualized number. Annualized number. His, his, his investors are pretty happy, I think. Yeah. I'd be pretty happy with a 15% return yeah. annually. And so that's Terry Smith. Anyway, he is a, a gentleman who started out as an analyst, actually. So he started out as an analyst at Barclays. And I guess over time, ended up uh, starting his own fund, you know, many years later. And sounds like he really enjoys what he does. Yeah. And I like him because he really likes to teach people. He does. Yeah. He is like Warren Buffett in that manner too, yeah, I think. Yeah, and Manish like kind of like that. Like he really wants to get this information out yeah. so that, uh, you know, regular people can get an edge in the market. Yeah. So he's actually written a book in the past. It was called Accounting for Growth. So that's a book to maybe check out. I'll probably end up checking it out and looking yeah. into it a little bit. So what are the top five companies in his portfolio according to the last 13F filings. Okay, so on Dataroma, the largest holdings that he has right now, the top number one is Microsoft at 12.41%, Stryker at 6%, Meta at 6%, Philip Morris at 6%, and Automatic Data Processing at 6%. Although he also holds a pretty weighty position in Visa too. Okay. So that's, uh, that's number seven. And to round it out, he owns uh, PepsiCo, Alphabet, P&G, and a few others. So He's a guy, interestingly enough, that one of the, in researching him, he's a guy that tends to favor investing in things that you know. And he likes things like consumer staples. What he likes is companies that run out. Yes. He likes things you have to always buy more drugs. You have to always buy more makeup. You have right. to always buy more pet food. He loves he loves the pet industry. Yes, he, he mentioned that it. several times that he yeah, loves the pet industry. Yeah, in several different industry or interviews through several different years. He yeah, just loves the pet industry. Yeah, going back to 2010, reading his his shareholder level letter back in 2010, he mentioned Del Monte. Mm -hmm. Actually, was one of the companies that he owned, and he was a little bit frustrated because shortly after he made a large purchase in Del Monte, they got bought out, mm -hmm. and his main investment thesis there was not the canned. Fruit, fruit and vegetables, but was the dog food or the yeah. pet food portion of it. And then literally within months, they got bought out and he exited the position at quite a handsome That is so frustrating sum. when that happens. But he it was happens. frustrated because he then had to redeploy the money in yeah. something else. It happens to us. It has happened to us. It has and happened to us. You find a good company and then, of course, someone else realizes it's a good company yeah. and it's on the cheap, yeah. uh, which is why you also bought it and then yeah. it gets bought and out then, and boom. you're like, okay, well, there it goes. Now i got to find a new company. Now i got to deploy yeah. that money again. So, But yeah, he loves um, pet food yeah. or not pet food, or he loves the pet industry yes. because people are having less children or no children. Mm -hmm. So people are treating their pets more like family. Going back to what we said before, he favors you know certain industries. He's someone who says you don't have to be kind of a master of everything. Mm -hmm. He says there's certain industries they'd never touch. Banking being one, mm -hmm. insurance being another. Oil. Oil, chemical businesses, cyclicals, uh, utilities, uh, and airlines. Yeah. He said are things that he, he would never touch. Yeah. 
things he does like, obviously, like I can say the consumer staples, you know, Microsoft, Apple's, some of the technology, things like Meta and, and those kind of, uh, those kind of companies. Mm-hmm. So he likes products that run out. Yeah. Because you always have to buy them again. Buy them again. And that just reminded me of the, I can't remember his name, but he's on Shark Tank, the founder of Food. Oh, uh, Damon, Fubu, yeah. Damon. Jones. And he said that he didn't like jeans because they never wear out. He always wanted to do shirts. So same kind of idea. You're always replenishing and replacing. Right. He also looked for white space, which is mm. a term that I hadn't heard of before. And he mentions white space in a few interviews that I've listened to with him, which means areas where you know the product can grow. So he talks about oral hygiene and brushing your teeth. And a lot of the world doesn't you know, have great oral hygiene yet. Yeah. So that's a, an area of white space where that can like grow so someone like colgate palmolive could Mm -hmm. end up making some significant headways into industry like that yeah one thing that was interesting was he says he never holds more than 30 stocks but Mm -hmm. he never holds less than 20. right so he's not huge into diversification Mm -hmm. on his point i think is that excessive diversification would dilute your returns Mm -hmm. so i guess he figures he has 20 to 30 good ideas and that's about all he's going to keep track of yeah. and he does keep pretty good track of his companies so that's that's the other thing so having a larger basket that that makes it probably unmanageable to difficult to watch and we've experienced that as well right yeah. having many positions you start to lose track of things and yeah you, know. you just can't keep on top of them precisely so in terms of portfolio management that was one of our questions when we were first starting to invest like how many positions should we hold right and it seems like you start getting a collection of you know larger and larger and larger holdings but he he is a sounds like he's pretty strict on limiting his holdings from about 20 to 30 and that's about it which means he obviously sells and that's one area that i really struggle in is Mm -hmm. is when to sell or selling at all yeah and it is a little bit of a difficult decision to make because even he said in a 2019 interview that his biggest mistakes were selling a good company yeah well and that's the thing he did say that precisely he said something along the line of selling a a good company is almost never a good idea basically Mm -hmm. So if you have something that's running, the temptation is to sell it and take profits. Mm-hmm. But if it's a very good company, you know, you'd regret selling Google if you had bought it in, you know, 20, yeah. you know, 13 or 14 because it ran from there exactly. and it's, it, nothing had changed. Yeah. So he, he takes that. And if you listen to Terry Smith, oftentimes the best time to sell a good company is never. Right. The other thing he often seems to like is old companies, companies that have stood the test of time. So the average age, I think, of the companies in his portfolio is is in decades. Yes. Right? I think something... They're very old companies. Very old companies. Mm-hmm. And most of the companies in their portfolio, most, not all, but most of them have withstood, he says, you know, two world wars, you know, a Great Depression. And the Great Financial Crisis. The Great Financial yeah. Crisis. So he likes to see companies that have withstood the test of time. Now, obviously, there's some companies in the portfolio now that don't follow that, i.e. Microsoft and Meta. Mm-hmm. But you can argue they have followed the the great they're financial crisis. They're dot getting com. there. Yeah, mm-hmm. so they're getting there. But they're older companies. They're not. They're not the new kids on the block. Yeah, I think someone said to him. He said in an interview I listened to, said, "Oh, you like to bet on winners." Yes. And then he said, "No, I don't like to bet on winners. I bet on companies that have already won." Yes. So that's actually an interesting investment philosophy. His point is he's willing to pay a little bit more mm-hmm. for companies that have proven themselves. Mm-hmm. Interesting enough, he even said that. Uh, being cheap or on sale is secondary. He said that is not even the most important thing to him. Right. So he's not like scraping the bottom of the barrel no. for companies that are yeah. cheap and, you know, he'd rather pay up for yeah. quality. I wouldn't even say he's a value investor. Yeah, I would say I would say that I would say that same thing. The actually. fact that he said that he's like, it's just secondary. Right. He's like, that's a secondary thing. Yeah, yeah. So his exact quote in the interview that I had listened to about that, he says, is it cheap is not the most important question. That's secondary. Hmm. That's an exact quote from him. Right. So he'd rather see quality and then determine whether the price yeah. is Yeah. So fitting. he really falls into the Charlie Munger way of thinking is that it's better to buy a wonderful company at a fair price. Yes. Than a fair company at a wonderful price. Right. Hands down, no question. So he's definitely not a Graham style value investor. Not at say. all. Yeah. See, scraping the bottom of the barrel for, mm-hmm. for something to kind of piece out for parts. Yeah. And what I like about that is that as an investor, you're sometimes like, ah, oh, I just want to find like, how do I get an Apple at the bottom floor? Yeah. Or how do I, why, how do I find the Google, right. you know, back 15 years ago, right? Because right? you want that because you're looking at the chart and yeah. whatnot. 
but he doesn't even invest in companies until they've won, until they've proven themselves. Yeah. And he's annual has an annualized return of fifteen percent since. 20, since twenty ten. Since twenty ten. Yeah. And so that's very encouraging to me because you can wait. You right. can watch these companies. They can they can prove themselves. Yeah. You know the Lindy effect can work in their favor. Yeah. And you still have an opportunity many times over in the market to get into these great companies that have a great track record. Yep. You don't have to find the next big thing, which is very risky because for every Google or for every Microsoft, there's a, I don't know. There's a company that's gone bust. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So we've obviously established that Terry Smith is a fantastic investor. Mm-hmm. And we've looked a little bit at his investing philosophy. So what are some of the metrics he uses to find these great, wonderful companies? The main metric for him seems to be return on capital employed or ROCE. So he finds that important because one, it usually shows it's a good business. Mm -hmm. So mediocre businesses don't have a high returns on capital. These, it shows that it probably has some form of a moat. Okay. Companies that can continue to generate a high return on, on capital, um, are the ones that'll compound in the future. Uh, going forward. So. And he's changed his view on this a little bit. Mm-hmm. If you go back to his letters, uh, which you can find on on his website, website. Hunsmith website. Yeah. In the, at the beginning, he actually talks about investing in dividend paying mm-hmm. stocks. Yeah. But now, as of recently, he says he doesn't want a company to pay out a dividend. Yeah. In fact, he has said that to invest for income is it's not mistake. what he does. He yeah. says, I do not invest in income. And yeah. he wants them. He wants these companies that have very high ROCE to keep all that money and reinvest it back into the company because that's where the growth is. That's yeah. the growth machine. Yeah. Well, it makes sense. I mean, if the company can keep it and generate high returns on capital, better than paying out a, a small percentage dividend to us as shareholders, and then we got to figure out where to put it. Exactly. And pay tax on it probably. And I'm, not, I'm not as good as an investor as he is. So, no. Right, right? Or as these companies are. Right. If they have that high ROCE, I want them to yeah. deploy. Yeah. Well, if you think of a company like Visa that has a return on, you know, return on investment of something like 30%, I'd rather them keep the money yeah, than exactly. me keep it. I can't return yeah. you know, 30% on a continuous basis. That's crazy. Yeah. And I did really appreciate that he's changed mm-hmm. that he used he did he, he he used to look for companies that had dividends and he talked about that at yeah. the beginning and and now he says no 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 like we don't invest for income yeah and i like that he's been a fluid investor and that he's willing to change as he realizes the market and as he realizes what he's good at and yeah. whatnot yeah. yeah so the next one he looks for is uh there's gross margin and operating margin. Right. So we have ROCE, yeah. and now we have gross margin and, and operating, operating margin. margin. So he looks for those. And they've got to be, uh, they, the companies that he owns are in the, for the gross margin, they're around 64%, 65% as compared to the S&P 500 and the FTSC 100 or FTSE mm-hmm. 100, which would be 45 and 42% respectively. And operating margin, his companies will go somewhere around of, 26, 28% as compared to 18% okay. for S&P 500 so and FTSE 100. So he likes them to 100. really be, uh, they're a, a big they're, difference they're between winners by his a large benchmarks margin. and yeah. between his companies. Yep, the, and that, yeah. that's, his, that's his hurdle. Like he yeah. wants to find something that's going to beat the average. Now what's the ROC number? I think it's 20, he likes his ROCE to be 27%? At least. So yeah. the as of, yeah, somewhere between over the past, you know, seven, eight years ostensibly, it's between... A low of about twenty five percent, the high of thirty two percent. Compared That's to high. what would be the S and P. So S and P five hundred twenty twenty two is eighteen percent, and the uh, the FTSE one hundred is sixteen percent. Okay, so he likes a big difference, a so wide a margin. So a wide margin. I guess that would be what he would consider his margin of safety. Right. Right. Since he doesn't focus so much on price, he does a little bit, but yeah. he doesn't focus a lot yeah. on price. He focuses on other other things. So he needs. So that is his margin of that safety. That is his margin of safety. Yeah. So what's he has one more metric. So what was it? ROCE operating margin. Gross or, margin. Yeah, operating. Sorry, ROCE gross margin operating margin cash conversion. Cash conversion. And interest coverage. Okay, and what are the numbers for cash conversion? And so cash coverage? conversion is uh, low of eighty eight percent, high of one hundred and two percent versus eighty eight and sixty two percent for the S and P okay. and FTSE one hundred respectively, and then interest coverage is twenty times. Uh, you know, from a low of, let's say, 16 times to 20 times for his companies versus 10 and 11 for the S&P and FTSE 100. Okay. And this is a maybe a take-home point for us as investors is compared to the benchmarks. Not only do you want to perform, do you want to compare your performance to the benchmark? I mean, we've done that. 
mm-hmm. compare our performance, but you also want to maybe compare, compare your company. companies that you're holding. Yeah, that's something we haven't done is comparing our companies. And I thought that was a really good idea. Yeah. Like, why aren't we doing that? Why are we not finding these companies? Well, we are now. We are now. Yeah. <laughs> why weren't we though? Right. Like, yeah. Makes sense. <laughs> we got caught up on was comparing companies within the industry to other companies. Right. Right. So for instance, right now we're looking at Hershey. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm doing a deeper dive into it mm-hmm. because I already have a little bit of a position. Yeah. So I'm, you know, I'm comparing Hershey to other companies in, like Nestle, yeah, in um, the industry, and other ones in the industry. And so, but I didn't think of comparing Hershey to the actual benchmark. Right. Right. Yeah. If you want to beat the benchmark, your company's better be beating the benchmark exactly. too, right? In a yeah. sense. Right. And I'm like Alta, so I'll be comparing Alta to other similar companies within their sector yeah and but i'm not comparing ulta to the benchmark right yeah Yeah. exactly so anyway i I thought it was very interesting that um his companies and he goes through this in his letter every year his companies he compares them Mm -hmm. to the benchmark on all those metrics yeah and you know they all they always outshine them yeah which i thought was interesting so why don't we end with nine take-home points yep. that we have found after studying Fundsmith. Yep. And then next week we can go into more detail about those nine points. Sure. Okay, so invest in quality, number one. Number two, boring is beautiful. Number three, long-term perspective. Number four, understanding valuation. Number five, avoid market timing. Number six, don't over-diversify. Number seven, don't predict future winners. Look for companies that have already won. Number eight, experience matters the most. Look for the Lindy effect. And number nine, keep a cap on cost. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And those were kind of the nine big Take takeaways that we got when studying. Yeah. Just to touch on those, one point there, going back to market timing, he doesn't think he can market time. In no. fact, he says he knows you can't. Mm-hmm. And I think, and this is a kind of an indirect pseudo quote here, he said something to the effect there's two kinds of people, two kinds of people who can time the market. Those who know they can't and those who don't know they can't, yeah. basically. So he's not a market timer, doesn't try to be a market timer. And the other thing he actually said is if you end up buying a stock and it goes down, it doesn't necessarily invalidate the investing thesis, yeah. right? So kind of along that mm-hmm. vein of market timing. Yeah. He said if it really bothers you that the stock price is going down, turn your screen off. <laughs> don't watch. If it's a good company. If it's a good company, because yeah. that will happen. And unfortunately... You can't pick the bottom, nope. nor can you sell at the top. I mean, as much as you'll try. Peter Lynch has talked about that. I think it was Taco Bell. He bought it yep. like seven dollars a yep. round, and he watched it drop all the way to one. Oh, that's gonna be painful. Yeah, but he knew that at seven dollars, it was still like a good, right? It was and, still a good buy. And yeah. that's the thing for someone like Terry Smith and someone like Peter Lynch. If you're confident on the business mm-hmm. and you have valued the business, you know what it's worth. Mm-hmm. You know what your holdings are worth. You'll be okay watching it. Well, I mean, maybe you won't be okay watching it, but you won't panic when it drops down to a buy. Right. You'll turn the screen off and be okay with it, exactly. knowing that the business is, in terms of Taco Bell, they're still selling tacos, exactly. right? And they're still opening stores. Mm-hmm. And just maybe lastly, one thing he says is he doesn't look at price, but then at the same time we said, well, we pulled out understand valuation. So obviously he does look at price. Oh yeah. But there was an interesting point in one of the interviews I listened to where he wanted to make like, where he said, I would make a bet with you guys mm. about, and he was talking about PEs. Yeah. Right. And he was, I think it was maybe Pepsi. I can't remember exactly what company. I think it was Pepsi. He's using an example. But he said, like, would you invest in a company with a a 15 PE? Right. Good company. Oh, probably 20. Yeah. Right. And then he got up to like 50 and 60. Yeah. yeah. And he was like, and and he was like, most people at this point are like, yeah, no. They're out. They're tapped. Yeah. Right. But he said, if it's a good company, even investing in those high valuations Mm -hmm. tends to pay out. And that stood out to me because I have to say, like, I would never feel comfortable investing in a company if it's price to earnings was 50 or above so think of a company like nvidia with a Mm -hmm. pe of like 70 something yeah or 60 something 70 it's crazy it's high it's it's high so you look at that and you know you get sticker shock yeah yeah no um not doing it and i've never done a deep dive on nvidia so i can't say but let's say they all their fundamentals beat all right. those benchmarks right. and, and you're looking at it and they're just really good at deploying capital yeah. and they have a really high ROC, then maybe that P isn't actually as scary as it is. You can maybe justify it. Yeah. And he gave a, a measure that you, what your return would be if you invested in Pepsi. I think I he said back in the was. Yeah. 80s or 90s or something like that, even at that high valuation, you still beat the S&P 500. Yeah, which is crazy. By like 1% or 2%. Yeah. I will say I am, I'm still more comfortable with Lee Lu where he said he... It's unlikely that you find a wonderful company with a P of less than 30. Right. So I'm still not 
on the on the fundsmith side where i'd be like oh yeah i, I can invest in a good company at 40 i'm more so like oh if a good company drops to 25 i'll i'll yeah i'll buy in but yeah well i think the other take-home point is maybe from someone like warren buffett is just be patient mm-hmm. he's wait, he's waited and watched for companies for decades yeah. until there was an event and, and he then has he snaps the advantage or has the advantage of living a long time. Living decades. <laughs> yeah. That's fair. Yeah, so no. What is your main competitive advantage? Live a long time. Exactly. Yeah, I think he said that. I think I mean, he did too. Be born at the right time and, be at the in the right, right time. country and, and live almost and live 100 a, years. And live a long time. Yeah. So I think we'll end there for yeah. this week. Next week we'll maybe extrapolate through those nine points, go a yeah. little deeper on some of uh, Terry Smith's metrics. Yep. And we'll draw more take home points for us as investors that we've taken away because mm-hmm. I think that's the whole point of this. We're going to yeah. study investors to try and glean some information and uh, beat study the market th- ourselves beat the market ourselves and study from the masters yeah so with that if you can like and subscribe this video that would be super helpful and we will yep. see you next week